some sub supersymmetry somehow, but now you're breaking further. Wow. Well, it turns out that the topological stable vortices can still exist as kind of isolated vacuum, basically as a minimum of those uh, superpotential, provided those minima has to coincide with, uh, if you have a mass particle, you know, they coincide with the mass minimum. And there's actually a very easy way to see why this has to be the case. That if you look at the f uh, potential that from this, uh, this uh, combined uh, system, <coughs> then you will see that, well, that's the minimum. So the equation is the minimum. And generally, you have Q and Q tilde to be, well, to be non-zero. So at a generic point, then, you will have, have both of them have a non-trivial expectation value. And that's telling you that both Q and Q tilde has to satisfy uh, the vortex equation if you want to declare a vortex in each. But however, we know Q and Q tilde, they are really the two scalar in the, uh, in the A plus two hyper and they charge in the opposite way under the cartan uh, of the gauge group. So they are opposite charge space plus the minus. So that's telling you that you can, basically there's a theorem like proved <coughs> by Witten a long time ago, uh, basically telling you that you cannot have both of them to be non-zero. You have to have one of them to be zero or the other. Otherwise, you know, basically, it's a, it's a light one that cannot have a, um, cannot have, a, have, have both of them to be so you actually need one of them to be vanished. And that's basically telling you this guy has to be zero. Or basically, another way to say it is that, of course, you cannot have you know, both topological, basically, positive, which, um, basic vortex configuration with a positive topological charge and a negative topological charge. And that wouldn't be stable because they will pair and now. So, in so all this symmetry breaking pattern, like we now break 4 dA equals 2 to A equals 1, also descends down to the two-dimensional wall volume of the vortices. And in fact, there's actually a very similar pattern. Like, don't worry about all those indices, but if you know, you know in two dimension that they can be left mover and right mover. So with those, that's what this common means. There's a left mover and right mover. But the new ingredient here is really that, that in two dimension, there's this new guy called the Fermi mode which is different from the four-dimensional supersymmetry that um, you know you always learn there's one super multiplier that has to be a bosonic degree of freedom, there's a Fermi only degree of freedom. But in two dimensions, that doesn't have to be the case. And in fact, for this case of a something called zero comma two, so you only have a supersymmetry in the right moving sector. There's a Fermi multiplier which contains only, sorry, the left moving sector only contains left, left moving Fermi and the no propagating um, boson. And that allows us to decompose those, um, those two comma two fields I spoke about earlier into a zero comma two. And the 4D supersymmetric breaking effect actually also descend down to the two dimension of uh, vortex worksheet. And uh, we can, again, like introduce a super potential that which actually takes exactly the same functional form as the, uh, the, the, the 4D super potential introduced earlier. And uh, now you can show that this actually still preserve, um, you still have a supersymmetric factor in this here. And uh, the system basically now, basically the punchline I want to get at is that now the, in n equals one supersymmetric gauge theory, uh, the vortices are really described by a two dimensional zero comma two uh, supersymmetric field theory. <coughs> So just now we were really, really talking about those kind of dynamical kind of vortices that can really freely move. But just like, for example, in the, in the gate theory, we are familiar with like electrons. They are happily moving. But at the same time, we can turn on the Wilson line. They don't move. They just have some specific open pitted over there. And the same we can do, for example, generalize this idea to the case of vortices. Uh, okay, so we have dynamical vortex some So of course we can also just have a two-dimensional defect that is now acting like the boundary condition to your four-dimensional gauge field. Provided those defects actually still preserve basically a two comma two uh, supersymmetry in the A equals two theory. But they still need to talk to the they still need to talk to the four-dimensional theory. So what do you do? Well, you basically gauge the Flavor symmetry from those two dimensions, two comma two theory. They can be, you know, have some 
get a degree of freedom. And they can, they can be part of, when you gauge those, uh, those flavor symmetry, they can actually be part of the 4D uh, gauge of flavor symmetry. So for example, instead of consider like the vortices, which are really described by the UK gauge theory, and with uh, those adjoint uh, carols and some fundamentals that we covered for the degree of freedom that we have earlier. But now we can really just looking at the simple like SQDDs, like the two dimensional SQDDs. So you don't have this, uh, this additional adjoint there. And in fact, it turns out that they are really, there are different possibilities that one can write on different kind of gauge theory. And they are really labeled by uh, different kind of representation on the four dimensional uh, gauge symmetry group that you will see. So uh, that's kind of some generalization. And then one, one can actually, um, yeah, we're happy to discuss about this a little bit more. So, um, right, so you can ask, well, you know, so how about this kind of coupling that generalized to uh, n equals one? So Well, of course, just now there was another description that we were, you know, on, on slide one that we know along, you know, when we zoom in those uh, uh, center of the surface operator that they develop the singularity. So there's another way to actually describe those defects in the 4D theory, which is really kind of labeled by um, different singularity pattern that when you zoom in the surface operator. And those integer uh, alpha one plus, those, those Sorry, not integer, those number, alpha one, alpha two, and alpha n c are really labeling uh, the the elements of the u one n c minus one Carter subgroup of u two. So suppose if some of those uh, integers are actually coinciding with each other, then well, we are really kind of labeling them by partition of the uh, well, n c numbers. And uh, so the symmetry breaking pattern. So now you don't just have like in the in the case of a vortices, you break your gauge group completely, but you can still have some residual <coughs> gauge degree of freedom, uh, breaking by n c two and things like this, and n one to n n, so just a number, how many number of integers they actually coincide. And this is something called a Levi uh, group, and your vacuum manifold is a SU and C quotient by that, and generally they are some flat manifolds. So actually, those two descriptions should be somehow equivalent to each other, but uh, um, there are some remain. There are some kind of um, still some work to be done like, to actually show those two descriptions are really giving exactly the same. Um, for example, the same partition function if you introduce the vortices in your theory. All right. So now I'd like to uh, change the gear after this a general discussion about the kind of vortices. I will change the gear to talk about some exact computation of the uh, uh, basic partition function in the supersymmetric gauge theory. And I think Kazuo a few weeks ago did a very good work on this, like to lay a lot of uh, background. Okay, so basically we are, so recently there are some, you know, um, some progress in applying the local, so-called localization technique, which allow us to really reduce the otherwise very difficult um, calculation of a pass integral. Usually you would involve, you know, integrate over infinite degree of freedom, but instead you are kind of pin yourself down to some finite saddle point, and you only need to in, kind of integrate over a quadratic fluctuation around those saddle points. But the key here is really you want to put those, you, there are a few ingredients. Now you want a supersymmetry, but you also want to put those field theory that on a curved manifold with a certain isometry. So the particular kind of partition function that I will be dealing with is actually probably the simplest Instead of looking at you know those uh, spheres or like some deformed version, I'll be looking at a torus essentially, or a generalized version of torus. So, so in this case, so to do so, we actually do, do have both supersymmetry and conformal symmetry, and it's a super conformal symmetry. So, um, so in the case of four-dimensional super conformal field theory, we can define the following super conformal index which is like a general like, idea of a so-called Witten index that uh, you, you're familiar in quantum mechanics, which comes your ground state. But now you can imagine if you are modifying your, uh, your, your Hamiltonian, if you want, you are basically in your calculated Witten index, you're summing all the ground state of a Hamiltonian. 
But now you modify a harmonic to allow for additional, for example, uh, angular momentum and also um, like R charge and R symmetry and so on. Then you have uh, those additional labels. But those labels are really are the, um, the Cartan label of your uh, super n equals to super conformal symmetry group. So this is basically a dilatation, and those are the two Lorentz spin in your two uh, planes in four dimensions. And those are kind of global symmetry charge, basically the R symmetry if you want to generalize very much barrier. And that's the end. that's basically the uh, the definition we have. But this trace here is only going to take him over a subspace of a of an entire possible Hilbert space of states in your theory that provided satisfies the following kind of minimal energy configure com in minimal energy. Condition. So if you want, like if you are familiar with an index, you can really think about this as a kind of generalized version of the of the kind of minimal energy configuration. But that depends on what particular choice of a supercharged Q you are using uh, to do the calculation. Okay. So, um, but of course, this uh, with an index, this uh, this uh, sort of super conform index can also be regarded really as a kind of twisted partition function over x1 times x3. And this you can really think about it basically, for example, you learn in two dimensions, uh, you have a radial quantization of a two-dimensional conformal field theory. You put it on a core. Sorry, you put it on a cylinder. But now, like in 4D super conformal field theory, you will be really looking at um, putting a theory on r times x1. And the r here really gives you the kind of time transfer. And now if you want a discrete spectrum, because now there's a non-compact direction, but if you want a discrete spectrum, then you will compact it by this radio into S1. And uh, so of some radius. But the, the crucial fact now is that if you look at the definition of the index here, now this thing is going to be tuned to zero in the end. So it's actually going to be uh, your final answer, on the other hand. It's like a cross, if you want. That the final answer should be independent from your compatible one. So we can do an analogous definition for the n equals one super conformal index as well, and uh, so there are all the labels which are really cartons of the uh, n equals one super conformal symmetry symmetry group, and uh, there's this uh, analog analogous zero energy uh, condition, and we can implement the supersymmetric breaking uh, condition that created introduced by the super potential earlier by really just implementing, kind of relating their, their, uh, those capacity parameter for those different symmetries. Because if you recall the difference between the, well, one of the differences between the n equals one and n equals two super conformal symmetry is that, well, in n equals two there's an additional SU2 R symmetry. And basically we need to combine that, uh, we need to break this guy and uh, um, to restrict ourselves to a beta new n equals one uh, case. And that can be done really by just relating the fugacity parameter P and P Q. And, that, um, and for the specific uh, power of a super potential, you can actually have a specific assignment. All right. So that was the four dimensions. On the other hand, we were dealing with the vortex wall volume theory. So we also want a two dimensional uh, index. And in this case, it really is basically, we are looking at really at a torus now, it's S1. And this is something called an elliptic genus, quite literally, as the name suggests. Like you are really on a, on, a, on, a, on a torus. So the natural function you'd be looking at would be an elliptic function. So, um, right, so, and that's the analogous definition for the, for the, for the, for the, for the super, for the super index in 2D. But as I alluded earlier, that there can be a left mover and right mover in two dimensions. So there are two copies of a super conformal algebra. And the label here, HL and JL, are really the kind of scaling dimensions and the R symmetry of the, uh, the left moving uh, super conformal symmetry in the, in the two dimensions. So now the trace again will be taking over some subset, sub, subset of states, which satisfy, on the other hand, this is um, related to the right. So 
you expect the final fun final final answer will be a basically a modular function that uh, depends on the complex structure tau of the torus. Okay, and the, the, the final one, so the zero comma two. Now the only subtlety here is really that now you only have the uh, R symmetries in the uh, right mover, not the left mover anymore. So the, the right moving fugacity that's actually going away. But you can still have a left moving define a left moving uh, scaling dimension. Okay, so let's do some computation from those uh, formulas. So well so we can basically so we'll, we'll return to our case of four dimensional inputs to SQTD that we were looking at earlier. So for that particular theory, this is the final expression for the uh, for the superconformal index. The function is interesting here. I mean, this is all complicated. Don't, don't worry too much about it. But the only thing to actually take away here is really that, okay, so this function, this is like some elliptic gamma function, some generalized version. Analysis, but this function has a simple pole, so we are doing a contour integral. Okay, so it has a simple pole when x equal to with a minus integer power of p and q, and p and q are really the fugacity we have earlier. And so that's a simple proposition. But what's the physical interpretation of those simple poles? Because those are the ones that are really going to give you a dominating contribution to your index. So what are the states you are really comfortable with? Well, so let's finish your calculation first. So we can use this uh, residual uh, formula, uh, which is reduced, the residue are really given by functional beta function. All right, so what are those really physical interpretations for the poles? Well, they are really uh, can be regarded as a kind of quantized version of this uh, root of baryonic Higgs um, condition I was mentioning earlier. And if you recall what I was saying just now, that it's basically where the there are additional flat directions that are actually open, opening up. There are additional light states in your theory that, um, that will basically create a singularity in this partition function you have calculated. So for example, that, uh, as, a, as a simplest case, when m and n, or this pole number, are equal to zero, and this is precisely the condition we had earlier for the uh, root of Baron and Higgs. But on the other hand, now, for non-vanishing m and n, now, they are actually, basically, they are the infinite number of poles. And those are really, really correspond to the uh, um, basic baryonic operator, not describing the addition of vortices, basic dynamical vortices that uh, exist in your theory. Or another way to really think about it is now that usually when we think about the vacuum expectation value, we think about the constant as but we can generalize this idea. If suppose if your symmetry is only broken at some sub manifold in your space point, so it's very natural to think about, for example, now your expectation value to actually become spatial dependent. So you only you know zoom in once you, for example, you know they could have a singularity. They could have zero. Basically, this function b can have a zero at where the vortex is actually off. But that's correspond to you actually kind of zoom in your wall volume of vortices. And th at that point, you are expecting to see that they have symmetry, they have your gate symmetry actually get restored. It's like, for example, you know, you are looking at the superconductor. But once you kind of probe into the, 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 the going to the penetration depth, going to the distance that are much smaller than the size of, the, of those cubes, then you do see your electromagnetic flux. It's only away from it, you see the things that actually get broken. And you can parametrize this just by a, by a vacuum expectation value of the, uh, uh, in this case, the barrier we operate. And since those guys actually depend on um, basically Z and W, then they can uh, have generally have a non-vanishing derivative. And those derivatives are really precisely correspond to the angular momentum carried by those uh, uh, vortices in the basically transverse. Okay, and then in fact, it's crucial to actually, if you really think about it, that it's crucial to actually have those additional angular momentum for the um, for this vortex to remain, so to become massless. Because, well, otherwise they have finite tension and they go around the circle. You need to have angular momentum to actually stabilize those 
those configurations. Otherwise, you go around loop, you just contract it. And uh, I was told. So, so you have centrifugal forces to actually stabilize the configuration. All right, so if you actually do the calculation, I mean, it's messy in the middle. So, but, it's, but, but the final answer has this rather nice structure, which is really that now you have some contribution some, on some four-dimensional free scalar field, hyperbolic. But those are really, you know, if you remember those, uh, those equivalent diagonals, they are really those additional flavor um, you have in the box. But on the other hand, there are two copies of those two-dimensional elliptic genus I was talking about just now. And they only, despite the fact, you know, on the previous slide, there was this complicated entangled expression that depends on CSQ. Now your final answer actually just boils down to only depends on either P or Q here. I really kind of correspond to the uh, respective the elliptic genus of the two poles. So just to show I actually did the work, or Xiaoyi did a lot of work, that, um, that basically that was the final uh, expression that would be written in terms of the theta uh, function. So, all right, so the only thing to take away is, okay, why is there such a structure? Well, so, so there are just some natural parameters that show things work, and I will skip this one. Okay, so it's not very interesting. Well, to understand why we have this kind of really kind of nice factor right flow force, we can really try to connect the recent progress in cal calculating this, you know, is that at least function in other dimensions, in other term manifold. So actually, those four dimensional superconform main deck we were talking about are really like an S1 on the S3. But there are some additional twists due to those forgasses. But we can actually absorb those, so that just means that, you know, you feel a wave function going around the circle, it doesn't quite come back to itself. There are some shifts. But you can actually absorb those shifts by kind of deforming your base. You know, now we can S3, you kind of squash it a little bit. And that squashing is precisely going to those, uh, uh, something called ellipsoid. So instead of, you know, you're defining your, uh, your, your sphere by x1 squared plus x2 squared plus four squared equals one, but you're kind of resizing the x12 and resizing the x34. In fact, it's resizing all of them. And that's the metric. Okay, so you now basically have a trivial vibration of s1 over this ellipsoid. And now there's some modification of the radius. And this b here is really the squashing parameter, which are really related to the pH. But if you learn a little bit more mathematics, that um, now if you look at those squash, those S3, then we, we know these things can actually be written as something like Hopf vibration. Then you can cut the base, Hopf vibration is basically S1 over <coughs> S2, but you shrink the size of the, the, the S, S, S2, basically S2 as we go. But you can cut the, you can cut the base of this vibration, that of S2 into a two different disks. So basically your squash three sphere, or this ellipsoid, basically become two copies of S1 times um, it becomes two copies of S1 times D3. But you are gluing gluing them so the boundary of those S1 times D2 are really a torus. So you describe it by a, by by its its own complex structure moduli. But to build them uh, ellipsoid, you basically Google them in the opposite way. And that's why we're trying to say here that then you, you change the A cycle and B cycle in the torus. To actually build, to, to get a sphere out of it. That's it. But in the other if they Google them directly, you actually get S1 times S2. Okay. So, those partition functions defined on the S1 times D2 are really something called a holomorphic law. And we can naturally interpret that, that, that those guys are really like, like a vortex partition function in three dimensions. Where the natural fixed point, if you think about trying to do a calculation on this, what, where the point is the most symmetrical? Well, you basically have this circle sitting right on the, on the, on the north pole of this uh, disk. And you have some, you know, some, some flux tube 
some big flux line going around it. And that's precisely, you can imagine that now you have a magnet, mag magnetic monopole in three dimensional point particles, but this wall line is wider around it. Now, if you add another S1 into this, uh, with our original S1, <coughs> into our, to get back to our original geometry. Now, this S1 combined with this wave one into a torus. So does this one. But they intersect along this common S1. So if you're trying to calculate through a localization of this geometry, the natural fixed point will be having a two-dimensional defect, uh, rocking on this torus and rocking on this torus. But they intersect along a common circle. So now it becomes very clear that, that in the previous slides, why we have this uh, structure. And this cross term are, sim are simply arising from you know, those two torus, maybe two sets of uh, vortices if you want, they kind of cross each other, then you have a link configuration. So I will skip that part, I want to go to the other slide. Can you move this? So, and that's, that basically explains the structure of the um, of this partition function and why we actually achieve the, the, the matching of the basically we can break down another way to put it is that we can really break down our four dimensional partition function really into some small building block <coughs> of a two dimensional uh, two dimensional partition function for those uh, vortex low volume theories So, in the final few slides, I comment a little bit about the duality part. So, basically, in, so, the, so in four dimension, A equals two series, there's this beautiful electromagnetic duality, or you can generalize this as a chemical S duality. And you can ask, for example, now in the four dimensional series, then you have all these uh, defects, two dimensional defects. That how do they behave under this uh, uh, four-dimensional uh, S duality? Well, this actually become a beautiful kind of modular invariance in the partition function. This basically encoded become a modular invariance of those partition functions you calculate on the torus. So basically, they are the, the, when you actually integrate all these partition functions on torus, they become a function of those uh, uh, fugacity parameters, for example, your flavor parameters mass, the global parameters. But it turns out they actually invariant on the uh, certain exchange on the, those, uh, uh, those flavor parameters. But you can actually interpret it, this kind of modular invariance as you are really looking at the same gauge theory, but there are different ways to gauge the flavor symmetry or embedded flavor symmetry into a four-dimensional uh, SQCD. So this part are really describing so this upper part is really trying to describe a, a four-dimensional uh, SQCD, and those are the two-dimensional theories. And that's precisely the essence of the 4DX duality, that which are really exchanging the different um, different flavors in your in your in your in your in your in your theory. And if I can generalize this kind of modular invariance, not only in the, this kind of more symmetrical n equals two setting, but you can also Try to generalize in, in the uh, by breaking the supersymmetry. But what you really see is that this kind of modular invariance still persists in the n equals one setting as well. But actually, we can also deduce a, a beautiful kind of cyber-like duality uh, for the zero comma two uh, series in two dimensions, starting from the uh, two comma two series. And so basically, that's the that's the that's I mean, this 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 slide was supposed to represent this uh, the duality that we begin with uh, instead a two-dimensional SQCD, in which the gauge the flavor symmetry embedding the four D. But now this theory you can show that via this exact partition function calculation, 